This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on the topic calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, and it's a keyword based review as part of the University of Kentucky College of Medicine Department of Anesthesiology Didactics. The video cast will be published to YouTube. First of all, the ABA in training exam keywords for about the last decade on the topic calcium, magnesium, and phosphate. First, calcium, hyperparathyroidism. What's the signs of it? What's the signs of hypercalcemia? What's the acute treatment of hypercalcemia? Usually Lasix and saline infusion. Hypoparathyroidism, what's the treatment? Often calcium supplementation. Effects of hypocalcemia in the electrocardiogram would be prolongation of the QT interval. EKG changes with calcium, mainly around the QT interval. Prolongation with hypocalcemia and shortening with hypercalcemia. Problems after thyroid surgery, mainly things like damage to the parathyroid, which presents within 24 to 48 hours with symptoms of hypocalcemia, like perioral uh, tingling, Shostak's and Trezot's signs, such as tapping on the facial nerve and having contraction of the orbicularis oculi and putting a blood pressure cuff on the arm, inflating it, and having tetanic spasms of the forearm. Problems with calcium bound by citrate, that can cause hypocalcemia, citrate toxicity from both packed red blood cells and plasma. Calcium channel blockers and how they can potentially uh, affect neuromuscular blockade, potentiating it. Acetylcholine release, calcium is very much involved in the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic area, and uh, calcium potentiates acetylcholine release, and magnesium impairs it, gets in the way. Often, calcium and magnesium do opposite things. And dantrolene, how it decreases the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, a treatment for malignant hyperthermia. Under magnesium keywords, Hypermagnesemia treatment, oftentimes you don't have to do anything, but if it's acutely very high and having cardiac uh, electrocardiographic changes, calcium uh, can be administered intravenously. The cardiac effects of mag sulfate, if you bolus magnesium sulfate, vasodilation is one of the most cardiac ones and causes hypotension. Torsades, magnesium is used to treat it, which is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Alcoholism is often associated with many electrolyte abnormalities, including low magnesium, low phosphate, and toxicity of magnesium would be things like electrocardiographic changes and loss of deep tendon reflexes, things that we see like on obstetric anesthesia when intravenous treatment with magnesium uh, is given in very high doses, DTRs may be lost. Phosphate if you feed someone and don't provide phosphate to them, you're giving them lots of sugar, the uh, a phosphate deficiency can occur. If someone hasn't eaten for a very long time and you feed them again, uh, they can metabolize carbohydrate and phosphate can be used up and you can get hypophosphatemia, refeeding syndrome. Alcoholism, magnesium and phosphate are often low in patients uh, with uh, alcohol as their main nutrient. And then we'll talk a little bit about some complications of hypophosphatemia. In these keywords shown here, you can see that the green ones were from 2018 and the blue ones from 2019, the most recent in training exams. Let's move right into calcium now, which is mostly located in bone and extracellular. Now, circulating calcium about 40% of it is protein bound, mainly to albumin, and 10% is chelated to things like citrate and amino acids. But it's about half of it that's in the ionized fraction, and that's the important fraction of calcium. It's the active form, it's the one we should be measuring, it's the one that's homostatically uh, regulated, and it's the one that the pH will alter this uh, value of ionized calcium. So if we look at plasma uh, calcium in the ionized form, normal is about 4.75 to 5.3 milligrams per deciliter. Realizing that levels of albumin can affect total calcium concentration, but albumin doesn't affect the ionized calcium concentration per se.
So for example, in the top right, there's an equation that shows that if your calcium uh, measured was in a value x, but your albumin was only two, let's say, you could see that um, four minus an albumin of two times 0.8 would be 1.6, and therefore your calcium level would be lowered by hypoalbuminemia um, by about 1.6 for a drop of two albumin. So one way to remember, about 0.8 milligram percent per each gram percent decrease in albumin. Albumin, hypoalbuminemia can cause a low calcium total calcium that is. Now changes in plasma pH can also affect the degree of protein binding and the amount of ionized calcium. And in the graphic on the bottom right, you can see an albumin molecule in blue with hydrogen ion and calcium bound to it. In the case of alkalemia, where there's not many hydrogen ions around, you can see that calcium can bind to albumin and it will drop the ionized calcium level because more is bound to albumin. So alkalemia or alkalosis decreases calcium, low calcium. It also decreases potassium by the way. So alkalosis, low calcium, as opposed to acidemia on the far right where you have more hydrogen ions around, less surface of the albumin for calcium to bind to and more free ionized calcium. So pH changes the amount of ionized calcium. Calcium is essential for many things. One, excitation and contraction of muscle. And the graphic on the top right, you can see troponin, tropomyosin, and calcium and the cross-linking there for muscle to work. A very important one uh, related to the ABA IT keywords is neurotransmitter release. And in the graphic in the middle right, you can see the neuromuscular junction, presynaptic, postsynaptic area. And in the presynaptic uh, area, you can see a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now that calcium channel is very important because as calcium goes in, it results in the release of acetylcholine, which crosses the neuromuscular uh, junction into the binds to the postsynaptic membrane. What's well, the release of acetylcholine that calcium affects? So if you have calcium around presynaptically, it's going to potentiate the release of acetylcholine. If magnesium was very high, magnesium does just the opposite usually of calcium, and it impairs or inhibits the passage here of calcium into the presynaptic area, and there would be less release of acetylcholine. You can see why if you had lots of magnesium around, gave a obstetric anesthesia uh, patient, a laboring uh, patient magnesium, in large doses, you could see how they could potentially get weak and lose their deep tendon reflexes if magnesium is inhibiting calcium presynaptically. Calcium is also essential for blood coagulation, and you can see that prothrombin going to thrombin and fibrinogen going to fibrin, calcium is involved in there. Calcium is essential also for the activity of many of the drugs that we give, like epinephrine, that have beta agonist function. As a beta agonist comes and binds to the beta receptor, it increases cyclic AMP inside the cell, that second messenger, and mainly its function is to just open up channels and let calcium come in intracellularly, and you get more contraction of that muscle. So a beta agonist like epinephrine is going to increase calcium with inside the cell. Calcium is also important in the pacemaker and cardiac action potential in the heart. Let's look at the pacemaker first. On the bottom left, you can see the SA node um, pacemaker uh, depolarization. You can see that calcium is involved at the star. Uh, calcium comes in, positive charge comes in and contributes to that cardiac pacemaker. You can see then why a calcium channel blocker like diltiazem can slow the nodes of the heart. Cardiac action potential, calcium is also essential for the plateau phase or number two in the ventricular myocyte action potential at the star. It comes in during phase two, keeping it positively charged and the muscle contracted. Hormone secretion and enzyme secretion are also uh, uh, using a calcium.
uh, and needed in its uh, function. Regulation of extracellular calcium. Well, number one, parathyroid hormone, or parathormone is number one, and vitamin D. Both of those increase calcium, as opposed to calcitonin, which comes from the parafollicular cells of the thyroid, decreases uh, calcium. So in the graphic on the right, you can see that we can take in uh, calcium in our diet, cheese, uh, milk, etc., and <clears throat> The plasma calcium can be affected by parathyroid hormone, which will cause reabsorption from the bone into the plasma, so increase the calcium, and it will also decrease excretion of calcium in the kidney. So parathormone will raise calcium levels. If you have a parathyroid injury after thyroid surgery, after about 24 to 48 hours within that time period, you'll start to see the effects potentially of hypocalcemia because you don't have the parathyroid hormone around in adequate levels. And that is the one that causes calcium to come from the bone into the plasma and to decrease its excretion. Now vitamin D also increases uh, calcium in the blood. Calcitonin, you can see it in a purplish blue color here, how it from the parafollicular cells of the thyroid inhibits um, the, uh, the uptake of calcium into the plasma and actually facilitates it going into the bone. So we can get calcium through our diet, through our GI tract, and from our bone. It can leave our system mainly by depositing it back onto bone or getting rid of it in our kidneys. So if we look at calcium homeostasis, a little bit complicated here, but simplistically on the left, if serum calcium goes down and you get hypocalcemic, if you follow the green arrow, you can see the parathyroid embedded in the thyroid gland, which secrete parathormone in purple. And that causes the kidney to reabsorb calcium, causes calcium to come from the bone, it causes the kidney to release less uh, calcium or lose less calcium and more vitamin D so that we absorb more calcium from our gut. All those things together result in increased serum calcium. If our serum calcium gets too high, then the parafollicular cells in the thyroid, by the green arrow there, secrete calcitonin, which causes calcium to be excreted in the urine, more put back on the bone, and less vitamin D effects. So you can see how these calcitonin, parathyroid hormone, and vitamin D interact to tightly control our calcium levels in our body. Now some causes of low calcium, hypocalcemia. One, surgical damage to the parathyroids. After a thyroid cancer surgery, for example, or an adenoma surgery, if the parathyroids have not been identified and they might be accidentally have been removed, if you remove enough of the parathyroid tissue within the first 24 to 48 hours, tetany, um, laryngospasm, things like that uh, can occur positive Schaaf's dex and Trezol's sign. If you have severe magnesium changes, specifically hypomagnesemia, you can have suppression of the parathyroids. They don't release hormone as well, so you don't have as much parathyroid hormone around to increase your calcium. So magnesium can cause problems with calcium. Alkalemia. Um, <clears throat> if you hyperventilate someone or give them a whole bunch of bicarbonate, you can cause alkalemia which uh, the albumin molecule then will bind more uh, of the calcium and you'll have less free calcium. Hyperphosphatemia, if you give way too much phosphorus, usually they go in often in different directions. If phosphate goes up, often calcium goes down and vice versa. Citrate toxicity, if in the operating room we administer a ton of packed red blood cells very rapidly, a couple units every five minutes or so, or a large amount of fresh frozen plasma. Many people forget that fresh frozen plasma also has citrate in it. Large volumes of uh, citrated packed red blood cells or FFP administered can chelate calcium and result in hypotension, poor cardiac contractility, high central venous pressure from a, a failing heart. And 
more common if citrate clearance is reduced for some reason. So if you're pouring in blood and you don't have a liver that can take that citrate and convert it to bicarbonate, kind of like the liver also takes lactate and converts to bicarbonate, it can bind all that citrate that you've given, make bicarbonate if it's functioning. But if you're very cold or you're in the anhepatic stage, for example, of a liver transplant, the liver's not available to chew up that citrate, convert it to bicarbonate. Citrate can build up, bind the calcium, and get some of those cardiovascular effects that we touched on. Hypoparathyroidism, vitamin D deficiency, and precipitation of calcium, for example, in tissues during fat embolization, rhabdomyolysis, and pancreatitis are other causes of hypocalcemia. Now, the clinical manifestations of help hypocalcemia, let's focus on the heart first. Electrocardiographically, the classic finding, although not always present, is prolongation of the QT interval as represented in the box here. EKG changes, the classic QT prolongation, heart failure, rising CVP, poor cardiac contractility, and low blood pressure are the cardiovascular effects of hypocalcemia. Neuromuscularly, you can get tetany and muscle spasms as the calcium gets low, and muscle spasms not only in the striated muscle of our limbs, but also in the larynx. The muscles there can spasm. So if someone had a parathyroid injury during thyroid surgery, they could not only have muscle spasms of their extremities, but potentially laryngospasm also. So cardiovascular effects of intravenous calcium. If you're going to administer intravenous calcium, what does it do? Well, in general, we shouldn't be administering uh, IV calcium very often. In fact, probably IV calcium is administered too often, but after cardiac surgery, sometimes it's given. And in patients who have a lot of citrate being given to them through FFP or packed red blood cells. And in general, intravenous calcium is a vasoconstrictor as opposed to magnesium, which is a vasodilator. In hypocalcemic dogs, it also improves contractile function. But if a patient is not uh, severely hypocalcemic, usually what you see is the vasoconstrictor function of IV calcium and a raise in blood pressure rather than a big hypercontractile increase from that IV calcium. What type of calcium are you giving? Are you giving chloride or gluconate? If you give the chloride, you're giving about three times as much elemental calcium as if you give the calcium gluconate. And the calcium chloride form is much more hyperosmolar than is the calcium gluconate form. And calcium chloride should be given then through a central line. So the amount of elemental calcium is more in calcium chloride and its osmolarity is higher. Hypocalcemia in the anesthesiologist. A couple scenarios here that we can focus on. One is the previously mentioned citrate and how if there's a large amount around and the liver's not just, uh, picking it up and converting it to bicarbonate, then that citrate in the picture to the right can bind calcium. Electrocardiographic changes, QT prolongation. If we're given tons of magnesium, Magnesium and calcium interact, and if your magnesium is low, it can impair the secretion of parathyroid hormone, which is involved in raising calcium levels. So you can see how hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia could occur. Phosphate and calcium interactions, especially in patients with chronic renal failure, they tend to be hyperphosphatemic and hypocalcemic and you give them calcium supplements and then aluminum hydroxide or other types of phosphate binders to get rid of phosphate. Other things uh, that we find important with hypocalcemia in the perioperative period, neuromuscular blockade. If a patient's hypocalcemic, it tends to be an inconsistent response to neuromuscular blockers, not one way always or the other, but in general, we would think of it uh, potentially um, um, making the muscles not contract as well and be more sensitive to a neuromuscular blocking agent. Calcium channel blockers can potentiate uh, 
neuromuscular blockade. And in the top right, you can see uh, the demonstration of where calcium comes in presynaptically and results as it comes in in the release of acetylcholine vesicles. IV administration of calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. Remember again that you get three times as much elemental calcium from calcium chloride than gluconate and that calcium chloride is much more hyperosmolar than is the gluconate form. When we uh, give dantrolene, very rarely obviously, uh, but if we used it to treat malignant hyperthermia, dantrolene's mechanism of action is to block the sarcoplasmic reticulum release of calcium. So in the graphic on the bottom, you can see during an MH episode, there's lots of calcium inside that, that cell and muscles, uh, troponin, tropomyosin cross over and muscles uh, contract and are rigorous and create heat and carbon dioxide and acid. And we need to decrease that calcium inside. And we can do that by blocking the release from the ranadinin receptor uh, at the sarcoplasmic reticulum but not blocking the reuptake. And so as the body reuptakes the calcium and stops spewing it out, the MH episode we hope will resolve. Hypercalcemia now. What causes a rise or too much calcium? Hyperparathyroidism. If you had an adenoma secreting parathyroid hormone, that would be primary hyperparathyroidism. You could get hypercalcemia. Secondary causes of hypercalcemia. Example is chronic renal failure or um, uh, problems with uh, absorption. And increased parathyroid hormone is response to chronic hypocalcemia. In chronic renal failure, hypocalcemic and hyperphosphatemic oftentimes. If you have malabsorption, your calcium is low, so your, your parathyroid kicks in and you can get hyperparathyroidism. Now, Cancer, if it's really bad, can get into the bone, destroy bone, release a lot of the calcium from the bone. And uh, I, in my history, took uh, care of a patient one time with a calcium so high from squamous cell carcinoma that had metastasized to the bone that we were given saline and Lasix and drugs to inhibit uh, calcium's effects and putting calcium back on the bone and trying to decrease that calcium level. So cancer, bone destruction can result in hypercalcemia. Other things, Paget's disease where you have increased turnover from bone of calcium and if someone just lays in bed for a long period of time, quadriplegic patient is an example, can get hypercalcemic. So on the top right, hyperparathyroidism can be primary or secondary. Primary would be that parathyroid itself secreting parathormone in high levels from an adenoma is the example. So your calcium goes up, your phosphate goes down as it's excreted from the kidney. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, the classic, is renal failure where you have impaired phosphate excretion and impaired vitamin D activation. So your parathyroid hormone kicks up and you uh, end up having um, problems oftentimes with phosphate. And so the renal failure patient will often be taking calcium supplements and phosphate binders to decrease phosphate. Hypercalcemia treatment. If calcium is really, really high, severe, then uh, it's a medical emergency. And moderate hypercalcemia where you may have some symptoms like anorexia, nausea, and polyuria, and lethargy, and calcium's like in the range of 12 to 14 grams per deciliter. If you follow the algorithm on the top right for mild hypercalcemia, it's usually uh, asymptomatic, and you don't have to do a whole lot except just avoid things that make it worse, like thiazide drugs, and lithium, and too much calcium in the diet, and volume depletion, and laying around in bed inactivity. But if it's moderate hypercalcemia and it's symptomatic, then intravenous saline along with uh, Lasix can result in a calcium uh, calcioresis or loss of calcium in the urine. That's one of the initial treatments for moderate hypercalcemia, saline and diuresis. If it's very, very severe hypercalcemia, it's a medical emergency, there's 
muscles are weak, they're in a stupor or comatose, they're very hypertensive, they may have heart block and dysrhythmias, and they're very sensitive to digitalis if they're taking it, and their QT interval becomes shortened as opposed to hypocalcemia, which prolong the QT interval. And so the bottom uh, box shows an example of hypercalcemia's effect on the electrocardiogram, shortening the QT interval. In those cases of severe hypercalcemia, we're going to give them saline and we're giving them diuretics, and we may reach for drugs like calcitonin or bisphosphonates, which may take longer to act. And so we start with saline and Lasix, and uh, then later reach for the other drugs like calcitonin and bisphosphonates. Hemodialysis is something that can be used if uh, severe hypercalcemia is present with symptoms. Now let's switch to magnesium now. Magnesium is the second most abundant cation in the body. There's a lot of it around. Calcium obviously is very abundant. That's the most abundant cation. It's in bone. Magnesium is mainly intracellular and therefore if most of it's intracellular serum magnesium levels may not reflect what's really going on inside the tissues and that's kind of like potassium when we measure potassium a lot of potassium is intracellular and measuring the uh, plasma level may not necessarily reflect tissue levels when you have hypokalemia in the graphic on the right you can see that most magnesium is in the bone uh, some of it is bound to albumin about 30 percent and only one percent is circulating in the serum so protein bound about 30 percent as opposed to calcium which had about 50 percent bound or so magnesium it's absorbed in our small ball and we can excrete it or get rid of it from our kidneys uh, or absorb it if we need magnesium. And a normal serum level of magnesium is about 1.7 to 2.1 milligrams per deciliter. So intracellular, only about 1% is circulating of total magnesium circulating in the serum. What are some of the actions or functions of magnesium? One, enzymatic functions in DNA and protein synthesis. Um, it's a cofactor in many enzymatic reactions and on the graphic on the top right you can see magnesium as part of that sodium potassium ATPase which is necessary for keeping sodium outside the cell and potassium inside the cell. Calcium uh, antagonist, magnesium antagonist is a lot of calcium's functions. Potassium metabolism as we mentioned that sodium potassium ATPase keeps sodium out and potassium inside. We need that functioning well. And in the case of hypomagnesemia uh, and the kidney, we may not be able to reabsorb potassium back into the renal tubules if they're very much potassium depleted, that patient. And so if you're having problems with hypokalemia and you're concomitantly hypomagnesemic, uh, you can see why you would need to replace not only magnesium, but also the potassium that you would normally uh, give in the, that hypokalemic patient. So reach for both, not just the potassium, but the magnesium also. Now magnesium also influences the release of neurotransmitters at the neuromuscular junction. And in the top right graphic, you can see where calcium normally, uh, presynaptically, as it comes in through its channel, increases the release of acetylcholine. Well, magnesium inhibits there, and it's going to do just the opposite. It's going to decrease the release of presynaptic acetylcholine. And you can see then why high levels of magnesium can decrease presynaptic release of acetylcholine and cause weakness in patients who are hypermagnesemic. Magnesium also blocks the release of catecholamines from adrenergic nerve terminals and it antagonizes the NMDA receptor. And in the bottom right, you can see the NMDA receptor. That's the one that ketamine works at. And you can see magnesium, that little brown circle, sitting inside the NMDA receptor as a channel blocker. So magnesium antagonizes NMDA receptors. Clinical uses of magnesium in obstetrics as an anti-seizure tocolytic and hypotensive drug in preeclamptic uh, women. If given very rapidly, 
vasodilation occurs, and that's the most common cardiovascular side effect with an IV rapid bolus of several, milli, several grams, that is, of magnesium. Hypotension, vasodilation, flushing. Cardiac dysrhythmias, we can use magnesium to treat torsades to points, or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia as represented by the EKG graphic in this slide. Ventricular dysrhythmias, especially those related to digitalis toxicity. And rhythm disturbances after cardiac surgery, often we're replacing magnesium to try to reduce the chance of dysrhythmias after cardiac surgery. If someone is insulin resistant and hypokalemic, uh, magnesium is used in these situations to help the insulin work better and to uh, help your kidney uh, reabsorb uh, potassium as you're replacing it intravenously. Hypermagnesemia now. Um, what are some of the causes and manifestations if your magnesium is too high? Well, some of the causes is just you're taking in too much, antacids or laxatives. Um, or your kidneys aren't working very well, or you're giving so much intravenously like magnesium therapy and obstetrics. So iatrogenic excessive intake or intravenous administration uh, for obstetric uh, cases, that's some of the major causes. And what happens when you have too much magnesium? You lose your deep tendon reflexes. That's why we check those in obstetric anesthesia in patients on magnesium. They get a little bit sleepy. They can get weak and their muscles uh, cannot work as well, respiratory muscles, and they can have respiratory arrest. Cardiovascularly wise, we said that magnesium vasodilates and so hypotension can occur, but it also can affect the electrocardiogram and widening a lot of the intervals, including the uh, RS and PR intervals. And on the graphic on the right, you can see that um, the therapeutic range is somewhere about four to eight milliequivalents per liter when you're using it to treat in obstetric anesthesia, for example, and that you lose deep tendon reflexes somewhere up around 10, but you can get electrocardiographic changes even before you lose some of those deep tendon reflexes, the intervals increasing. And Usually, if you're going to go on to that SA nodal and AV nodal block, that's a much higher um, level of magnesium needed to cause that than the loss of deep tendon reflexes. So we check DTRs, realizing that that's one physical uh, sign way of trying to look at, is there too much magnesium present in this person that we're going to avoid iatrogenic complications from hypermagnesemia. Treatment. If magnesium is too high, if you gave too much, if, let's say you gave four grams of magnesium to a lady and were given two grams an hour and they got uh, weak and uh, had electrocardiographic changes, acute hypermagnesemia can be antagonized with intravenous calcium. You can also use saline and Lasix to help get rid of magnesium and dialyze patients if they're in renal failure to help uh, normalize magnesium. Remember that magnesium is gonna potentiate neuromuscular blockade, and if you are anesthetizing a patient with hypermagnesemia, neuromuscular blockade will be potentiated and we should reduce our dose. Magnesium antagonizes the release presynaptically of acetylcholine. Hypomagnesemia now, when does that occur? Alcoholic patients, critically ill patients, patients where you're sucking out magnesium from their gut from an N, with an NG tube or they're draining from their intestine or biliary fistulas, so you're losing it. Usually hypomagnesemia is asymptomatic, but it may be associated with other electrolyte abnormalities like hypocalcemia, because parathyroid hormone secretion is uh, reduced when you're also hypomagnesemic. You need magnesium for parathyroid hormone to be released. Hypokalemia, because their kidney is wasting it and needs magnesium as part of that sodium potassium ATPase to help reabsorb potassium. So when you're giving potassium, you may also be given magnesium. And it's often associated with hypophosphatemia um, uh, concurrently.
A patient who doesn't have much magnesium can have cardiac irritability, extra uh, beats, ventricular premature beats. If they're taking digoxin, they can have digitoxin, uh, digitalis toxicity. There may be more atrial fibrillation, and we can get prolongation of some of the intervals of the EKG. Remember that if you administer supplemental magnesium to treat this hypomagnesemic patient, the most common side effect of giving magnesium rapidly is vasodilation, flushing, and hypotension. On the far right shows some clinical signs of not enough magnesium in your muscles, uh, tetany, uh, seizures, um, cardiac wise, torsades is the classic uh, dysrhythmia, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia where magnesium is often indicated. And remember that other electrolyte abnormalities often occur along with hypomagnesemia and you should check the other electrolytes. Phosphorus. In the form of inorganic phosphorus, it is the most abundant intracellular anion. It's in ATP, it's in DNA, and phosphorus is present in bone, about 90% of it. Why? Because calcium phosphate it's bound to calcium, it's in the bone, it's stuck in there. About 10% intracellularly and less than 1% is extracellular. About half of it or so is free floating around. And phosphorus is taken up in the bowel uh, from our diet and vitamin D actually can enhance that. So in the picture on the far right, you can see in the food that we take in, phosphorus can be absorbed from our intestine. Um, from the bone, we can get phosphorus um, released from calcium phosphate, and it can go into our phosphorus pool. Phosphorus can be lost from the kidney in our urine. So these locations, intestine absorbing it, digestive juices, uh, we're losing it. Coming from the bone, either releasing it or taking it back up or excreting it from the kidney phosphorus homeostasis is controlled. And the normal phosphate level is about 2.7 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. What's the action or function of phosphates? What's the energy bond in ATP and creatinine phosphate? It's necessary uh, for that second messenger cyclic AMP, for example, which is involved in beta agonist activity. It is a component of nucleic acids and membranes, and 2,3-DPG, or 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, has phosphate in it, and that is what is involved in shifting the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve when 2,3-DPG goes up, shifts it to the right, so that release oxygen to the tissues better. And when it's low, such as in stored red blood cells, we have low 2,3-DPG, shifts to the left the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and hang on to oxygen more and don't release it to the tissues as well from that old low 2,3-DPG stored blood. Hypophosphatemia, if it's severe, and it has to be really severe, you can get cellular energy depletion and the muscles just don't contract. I've seen one patient in my career who was a young DKA patient from a jail actually, who had DK that was undiagnosed, came to the hospital and had a phosphate so low and a potassium so low, they could not breathe, their muscles were not working well and required mechanical ventilation and super high doses of potassium and phosphate supplementation over the days to get them back to normal. So energy depletion. It's common to have some hypophosphatemia postoperatively in traumatized patients. Phosphate can go through shifts intercompartmentally from alkalosis, remember alkalosis lowers calcium, it lowers potassium, and it lowers phosphate. If you have someone who's been fasting for a long period of time and then you give them carbohydrate ingestion, either TPN without phosphate or lots of carbohydrate uh, without phosphate orally, you can get a refeeding syndrome where potassium is driven into the cell, that is phosphate's driven into the cell, often potassium also, um, and uh, you can get severe hypophosphatemia from that refeeding syndrome. If you administer insulin, insulin drives glucose, potassium, and a phosphate uh, into the cell, and you can get hypophosphatemia.
simply a negative balance can cause hypophosphatemia. You're just not taking in enough. You could start TPN without enough phosphate in it. Uh, alcohol withdrawal, someone who's been getting all their nutrients from alcohol, and it could be hypophosphatemic or excessive loss to the gut or the kidney. Clinically, if you have really severe hypophosphatemia, if you have cellular energy depletion, you don't have ATP around, you can be weak, the heart doesn't function as well. Uh, if you don't have phosphate for 2,3-DPG formation, you're going to have impaired oxygen delivery because the oxyhemoglobin curve is going to be shifted to the left. White blood cells and platelets don't function as well, and you can have respiratory failure. So how do you treat it? The graphic on the right, basically replace phosphate only when the level is less than 2 milligrams per deciliter is one recommendation. If someone's asymptomatic, has a little drop in phosphate, less than 2, you can give it orally. But if they're symptomatic, you're going to go to uh, uh, intravenous and then switch back to oral when their phosphate climbs back up closer to that 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. So treat hypophosphatemia. One recommendation at least is less than two milligrams per deciliter and if it's symptomatic, give it intravenously. Let's finish up with hyperphosphatemia now. Too much phosphate. How can you get too much phosphate? Often if the kidney is not excreting it, someone in renal failure, um, you can have too much phosphate. Um, Vitamin D intake, uh, cell lysis or breaking down cells and phosphate being released from chemotherapy or rhabdomyolysis. Hypoparathyroidism is another one because uh, parathyroid hormone norm normally causes calcium to be picked up and phosphate to be excreted. So if you don't have a lot of parathyroid hormone around, you're not going to excrete the phosphate and it may build up. But number one is renal failure. And the mar marked hyperphosphatemia is thought to also lower plasma calcium by precipitating um, and depositing calcium in bone and soft tissue, like muscles, for example. So renal failure, one of the common causes of hyperphosphatemia. In renal failure patients, often we're giving them calcium supplements and then binding the phosphate with things like aluminum hydroxide agents to decrease the phosphate levels. Secondary hyperparathyroidism can occur if calcium is low um, from renal failure and no vitamin D or not getting enough in the diet, malabsorption. Parathyroid hormone kicks in and you can have um, a secondary hyperparathyroidism and that will try to increase the calcium and get rid of the phosphate. So it, treatment of hyperphosphatemia, if you have too much, well, eliminate it. Uh, the, the reason why you're giving it, if you're giving it to someone, take it out of their uh, diet if you can, especially if you were supplementing it. That could be a cause of hyperphosphatemia. And also correct the associated hypocalcemia. So the ABA in training exam keywords over the last decade on these we have covered. Um, they are here. Remembering that hyperparathyroidism can result in hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. That after you take the thyroid out, if you damage the parathyroid, you can get hypocalcemia. That citrate from both packed red blood cells as well as FFP, especially if you don't have a liver that's working well to break down the citrate, the citrate can bind calcium and cause hypocalcemia. That calcium is very much involved in presynaptic release of acetylcholine and it is involved in muscle contraction and it is decreased in its release from the ryanodine receptor sarcoplasmic reticulum by the administration of dantrolene which is given as treatment for malignant hyperthermia. Magnesium, hypermagnesemia, usually it's iatrogenic, uh, we've given too much intravenously for example, Vasodilation and hypotension can occur. Changes in electrocardiogram, specifically prolongation of intervals. We use magnesium to treat torsades. Hypomagnesemia is pr present commonly in alcoholism, severe. And if you have mag toxicity, for example, from giving too much magnesium, calcium can be used intravenously um, to treat it. And if it's really bad and you don't have kidneys that are working, you can give the calcium to counteract the cardiac effects of the hypermagnesemia.
and then dialyze the magnesium off. Phosphate can get deficiency from um, feeding someone who has not been fed for a long time, refeeding syndrome with TPN or oral uh, glucose, and the phosphate goes inside the cell. Muscle weakness can occur. Alcoholism, like hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia can occur. And the complications of hypophosphatemia are really muscle weakness, cellular energy depletion, cardiac myopathy, cardiac not working well, and impaired oxygen delivery because of 2,3-TPG being decreased. This ends calcium, magnesium, and phosphate discussion, and I hope you have a great day. This picture on the left is climbing Cold Isron, and the one on the right at the top of Cold Isron, 27 degrees and snow in the French Alps, September 2019. Thank you very much.